There was a missionary to China, inland, for 51 years by the name of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor went through great difficulty, but yet he completely trusted in the Lord. In his journal, he wrote down something that I believe will encourage us today as the Church of Christ in the year 2021. He writes this in his journal. Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced one. He knows very well that his children wake up with a good appetite every morning. He sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. We do not expect he will send three million missionaries to China, but if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. Depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. That was his famous statement. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Hudson Taylor completely trusted God. Why? Because he truly believed that God is faithful. Absolutely faithful. The God of the universe, the God of the Bible, is absolutely faithful. We're in 1 Kings chapter 8. The goal is to get through verses 12 through 21 today, partly, and then the rest of it next Sunday. Let me remind us of the background. The temple is now completed under King Solomon's reign. In the inner court, the sea of cast metal and other furnishings and items are in place. And in the main hall, which is the holy place, there are other holy furniture and holy items like the golden lampstands and the table of showbread. And now the most holy place or the holy of holies has the Ark of the Covenant underneath the cherubim. And the question that we should have been asking over several weeks and months is, will the Lord bless his people with his presence? When we look at chapter 8, verse 10, the answer is a resounding yes. The Lord is with his people. And in your bulletin, the main point that I want to get across this morning is the Lord always, the Lord always fulfills his promises. The Lord always fulfills his promises. I hope as the people of God, we believe that, that this is not some Christian cliche that we say on Sundays. Oh, God is faithful. No, do you believe that when you read it, when we see it in the holy pages of Holy Scripture? I pray that we truly believe it with all of our heart, that God is always faithful to his promise. And we'll see this in three important ways this morning. The Lord is holy. Number two, the Lord is truthful. And number three, the Lord is deliverer. The Lord is deliverer. So let's talk about number one. The Lord is holy. We'll see that in verse 12. Read with me. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. So in verse 10, the Lord finally descends upon the temple. He fills the temple in the form of a cloud. The Lord God is not a cloud. Just for those, who have, those of you who are wondering, is the Lord a cloud? No, the Lord is not a cloud. The Lord is spirit, according to John chapter 4. But in this example here, this is called a theophany, where there is a visible manifestation of God's presence amongst his people, a theophany. So God is not a cloud, but we see his presence and his presence is absolutely glorious. I would label this cloud as the glory cloud. That God came down from his heavenly boat to rest and reside with his people in the form of this glory cloud. And this cloud represents not only God's presence, but God's glorious, God's glory. It was so glorious that the priests couldn't even continue their priestly duties. And that was kind of God for the priest to move out of the way before God came upon the temple. And so the priests were hindered from their work because God's presence was so glorious. And why is God's presence very important? Well, I said it last week, that the greatest gift that God's people could ever receive is the presence of God himself. The greatest gift that mankind could ever receive is to be in the presence of their creator. Amen. 
All of us should desire such, especially if we're Christians. If you're not a Christian today, I don't expect you to desire God. Why? Because spiritually dead people hate God. That's what spiritually dead people do. They do not desire the things of God. They hate God. So if you're not a Christian, it doesn't surprise me if you don't desire God this morning. But if you are a Christian, the greatest gift that we could receive is God himself. And God is with his people in the presence or within the temple. But when we think about it, God's presence does something special for God's people. Because God's people are very, very distinct and different and separated from all other peoples of the world or all other peoples of the earth because of God's presence. We see that in Exodus 33, 16, that the presence of God with his people makes God's people separate from the nations. So when we think about this, the world is a polytheistic world. Polytheistic means people in their natural state love to worship any god under the sun. Small g, not big g, not capital G, small g. In other words, people in their natural state will worship any god under the sun. Whether it's a rock, whether it's a star in the sky, or a piece of wood on the ground. Mankind in their natural state are idol worshipers by nature. They hate God, and they create a God that they're comfortable with. Something or someone that they can manipulate and maneuver and influence. And they post it up and they worship and bow down to that God. But that's not the true God. The true God is the creator. He's the creator of the universe. And when God is with his people, his people are separated. They're different. They're marked out from the world. But also the opposite is true. So if the greatest gift that God's people could ever receive is God himself, his own presence, then the opposite of that is true, that the greatest curse that God's people could ever receive is the absence of their creator, the absence of God in a right relationship with God. That's why David cries out in Psalm 51, verse 11, cast me not away from your presence, nor take your what? Your Holy Spirit away from me. It is a sad sight if God ever leaves his people. That's why David, the psalmist, says, Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, nor take your Holy Spirit away from me. The greatest gift that God's people can receive is God himself. And this glory cloud represents God's holiness. God's holiness. God is holy. I've been harping on that for weeks because the American church does not remember this great biblical fact and doctrine, that God is holy. Exodus thirty-three twenty says this, but he said, referring to God, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. God commands Israel to leave this place and go to the promised land, go to the land that flows with milk and honey in Exodus 33. But the Lord says he will not go with his people. Why? Because his people are stiff-necked. That doesn't mean they need a chiropractor. What that means is that they're stubborn. They're hard-hearted. They don't listen to God. They listen to their own idols within their own hearts. And so because they are a stiff-necked, stubborn people, God says, I will not go with you because if I go with you, I will consume you. God says, I will destroy you for your sin if I'm actually in your presence. The holy God with unholy people, there's something catastrophic that is going to happen. Someone will die if that ever comes to fruition. The holy God with unholy people. So what does Moses say in Exodus 33, verse 18? He says, 
Lord, please show me your glory. Moses has no idea what he's asking for. He thinks that this is some little thing, some finite thing. No, this is a massive epic. This is a massive ordeal. God is glorious and he is holy. And Moses wants to see God in his full glory, in his full essence, in his full being, in his full effulgence. And so what does God say? He responds to Moses' request. He says, if you, were to able, if you were able to see my face, if it were even possible for you to see my face, you will die. You will die. You will not live. So if a man sees the Lord in his full glory, unmediated, he will die on the spot because God is holy. There's another example of God's holiness in Genesis 32. There's, there's examples all over the scriptures. But in Genesis 32, 30, it says this. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. So in Genesis 32, Jacob is on his way back home. And he tells his servant, Go to my brother Esau. And let him know that I am coming back home. Well, that servant comes back and reports to Jacob, your brother's on the way. Your brother's on the way. Oh, by the way, he's bringing 400 men. Now Jacob is distressed. He's anxiety stricken. He's worried and concerned. He is afraid. And that night, Jacob goes to sleep. But yet, he wakes up and he wrestles with a man. Until sunrise, this man is a mysterious man. And I would argue this is another theophany, another visible manifestation of the holy God. But not only is this visible, but this is tangible where you could actually touch this theophany because why? There's a physical res a wrestling match happening at this point that Jacob is wrestling this mysterious man. And at the end of this wrestling match, Jacob survives, which is pretty amazing. And in verse 30, Jacob calls that name Peniel. And Peniel translated in English means face to face with God. Face to face with God. Jacob was spared. Jacob should have died. If you've read that story, Jacob is not perfect. He's the furthest thing from perfect. He's a sinner who deserves judgment. He's a conniving schemer. He stole the brother's birthright. This is not a perfect holy man. And he should have died by wrestling with this theophany. But yet God in his grace and mercy spares him when he should have died. So going back to 1 Kings chapter 8, why this thick darkness? Why this cloud? Well, the bottom line is this, no one can see God and live. No one can see God and live. That is very kind of God to come down to his people in the presence of his people in the temple in a dark cloud. Because if God comes in his full essence and being and glory, he would wipe out the entire land with his holiness. So it was very kind of God to come down to his people in that cloud. He would have consumed everybody. And in verse 12, what Solomon is doing is he's quoting God. He's quoting God, what God has said about himself. That the Lord would dwell or abide in the temple in the form of this glory cloud. If you want the parallel account of that, that's 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And this should remind us of the Lord coming at Moses, or coming to Moses at Sinai in a dense cloud. That the Lord descends upon the people in a dense cloud. The Lord talks to Moses at Mount Sinai. But we also see other examples of this in Exodus 13. In verse 21, that the Lord led his people. Remember this? They're wandering through the wilderness. The Lord led his people by day, by what? By a cloud. 
He provided a cloud by day. And then the Lord led his people by night. How? By a pillar of fire. Another cloud. And the Lord led his people, whether it was day or whether it was night. It was the Lord who led them through the wilderness. Even though Moses was the physical representation, a prophet of God, it was actually the Lord doing the work. The Lord provided a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the cloud reveals that God is with his people. God cares for his people. God is leading his people. God has promised to be with his people. God has said, I will be their God and they will be my people. How kind and gracious of God to be with his people. The Lord God is transcendent. We heard that term earlier. That whatever is great in this world, if we can describe it that way, God transcends that. If you multiply it by a million, we still fall short of the transcendence of God. If we multiply that by a billion, we still fall short. If we multiply that by a zillion, we still fall short of the glory of God. His transcendent is beyond us. He is the creator. We are finite creatures. He is the infinite one. We are finite. God is holy. And it's amazing that God cares for unholy people. That He's with us as well. So not only is He beyond us and is transcendent, He's imminent. He is with us. Do you see that? That God condescends in a cloud to the temple. He does that in the tabernacle. He does that in the wilderness. God is with His people. He doesn't create the world and walk away like the Greek pantheon of dead gods. No, this is the living God who creates and He's with His people. He is with His people. And in the New Testament, God is with His people through Jesus. I've talked about this last week. You shall name your son Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God. Jesus claims to be God. And Jesus is God with us. God with us. So we should praise God and we should bless God because God is with us. And how do we know that? He's given us His Son. Emmanuel, God with us. Number two, point number two. The Lord is truthful. We see that in verse 15 and in 20 and 21. Please read with me in verse 15. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. This is Solomon saying this. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father. Verse 20. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's a mouthful to read. But one of the best ways to explain this is this, and I hope you write this down. Promise first, then action. Promise first, then action. God made a promise to David, and we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which I've recited multiple times. What does God say to David? God says to David, I will make your name great amongst the nations. And that God's people will have their own land, called the promised land, the land that flows with milk and honey. And I've defeated all your enemies. And I will give you rest on every side from all your enemies. And when you die, David, I will raise a son from your loins, a seed, a descendant. And this son will rise up and sit on your throne. And I will establish his kingdom forever. 
That was the promise to David, known as the Davidic covenant. And in 1 King chapter 8, verse 15, Solomon describes the Lord with what? With a hand and a mouth. As I said earlier, God doesn't have a physical attributes. He doesn't have a physical hand or physical mouth. So that's called anthropomorphic language. That's for us who have pea brains, who are human, who are finite, so that we can understand the greatness of God in language that makes sense to us. God made a promise with what? His mouth. Oh, we understand promises, right, parents? We make promises to our kids. We don't make promises to our kids via sign language, right? We make promises to our kids via our mouth, our words. But then those words or that promise is fulfilled when we say to our kid, child, I promise I'll take you to McDonald's and you're going to have the best burger of your life. Now, our kids don't know any different, right? It's the dollar menu at McDonald's. And then so we make a promise and we fulfill that promise. But our promise, because it's a human promise, fails in comparison to God's promise. Because the promise that we make to our children, even though we love our children greatly, at best is 50-50. At best. If we're tired or we're sick or we just don't feel like it, guess what? That promise is not going to happen on the day that you promised your child. And your child will remember that promise, by the way. I hear it all the time from my kids. Right? We make empty promises. But God, when He makes a promise... It will come to fruition. It will be fulfilled. It will be satisfied. The God that we serve makes promises and he keeps promises. So that's what it means to say that the Lord has a mouth and a hand. He makes the promise with his mouth and he fulfills it with his hand. God is spirit. He doesn't have a physical mouth or hand. And we can trust the Lord when he makes promises to his people. When we see a promise in the Bible, God's people, we should claim it. We should claim that promise. Not in some weird, quirky way, right? Oh God, give me a Mercedes Benz. Oh God, give me a mansion. No, not things like that. We should be grateful when God makes a promise. For example, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or I will be with you to the end of the age. So when you're distraught and distressed and you're worried and you're concerned, does God love me? Does God care for me? God gave us His Son. He's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. That's a promise that we can take to the bank. And thank God for that. So how does Solomon have any confidence that God's promise is true? Well, the promise came to fruition. It was realized. In verse 20, what does Solomon say? I've replaced my father. My father was the king. He died, and the Lord raised me up. Also in verse 20, Solomon says, I sit on the throne as the king. Also, Solomon says in verse 20, I've built a temple for the name of the Lord. That's how I know that the promise is true. And in verse 21, Solomon says, I've provided a very special place in the temple, the Holy of Holies, for the Ark of the Covenant, underneath the cherubim. That's where the Ark will be placed, in the most holy place. So what the Lord has promised to David has come to fruition. And so Solomon is arguing, I know that the promise made to my father David has come true. Why? Because all these personal things, all these experiential things have happened. And I've experienced it. And I know it. However, as Bible-believing Christians, when we apply that idea or concept to our lives, we do not say that the Bible is true, God's Word is true, because I feel like X. Or I have experienced X. Let me give you an example. Jesus is Lord of my life. How? Because I just feel it in my heart. 
Whether you feel it in your heart or you don't feel it in your heart, Jesus is still Lord. How do you know that you didn't take enough Pepto-Bismol last night to make your tummy feel better? Right? So what, what I'm trying to say is this. We take our personal feelings and our personal emotions and we put it on top of the Bible and we say the Bible is true because I feel like X. I personally experienced X. What if your stomach just made you feel bad or made you feel good? No, we say the Bible is true because God is true. Regardless of how we feel, regardless of how we think, regardless of what the world says about us. See, if we live our Christian life based on how we feel, what hope do you have? Because every day, you're like the stock market. Three steps up, two and a half steps down. Three steps up, two and a half steps down. You're all over the place. But the sure foundation is God's Word. We can trust in that. We can rest in that. No matter how we think and no matter how we feel, we are Bible believers first. And God is truthful. He cannot lie. It's not even possible for God to lie. He never lies. He always tells the truth. That is His character. That is His nature. That's what the holy God does, is tell the truth. It's impossible for God to lie. God's Word, God's Bible is the truth. It's, in, in, it's inerrant, meaning it's without any mixture of error. There is no error in God's Word. If you want to talk about translation variances, that's a whole different topic. But we're talking about God's Word because it is true because God is true. We need to quit living lives as Christians based on what the world says or what the news says or what fake news or real news or however you want to call that. We stand on the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God. We are Bible believers. And God's truthfulness in one hand and God's faithfulness in another hand are deeply connected. Because God is truthful, God is also faithful. Because God is faithful, God is also truthful. They're two sides of the same coin. The God we serve cannot lie, and because He cannot lie, we can trust Him. In any circumstance, dear Christian, in any circumstance, it's impossible for God to lie. And if He gives a promise, He will carry that promise all the way to the end. It will happen. We make a promise, we break our own promise. We go back on our own word. We give a promise to people we care for, and we rip that promise out of their hand. God gives us a promise, He puts it in our hand, and He fulfills it 100% satisfied. God is faithful. The problem is we are unfaithful. That's the problem. God is true. God is faithful. And so we have this promise in action. And the Lord fulfills His promises because He is the true and truthful God who cannot lie. Which leads to point number three. The Lord is deliverer. We'll see that in the first part of verse 16 and the last part of verse 21. Please read with me in verse 16. Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt. And then in verse 21, it says, And there I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So in verse 16, Solomon is quoting what God has said to his father David regarding the deliverance of Israel out of the oppressive hand of Egypt. And then in verse 21, we understand also that Moses is not the ultimate deliverer of Israel. The Lord is the ultimate deliverer of Israel. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. 
So in verse 20 and 21, the Lord credits himself. The Lord credits himself for the deliverance of his people. The Lord says, I brought my people Israel out of Egypt. God did so with a mighty and powerful hand. So in verse 21, Solomon simply affirms that the Lord is the true redeemer. That the Lord is the true deliverer. He brought his people out of Egypt. And when we think about Egypt, we just kind of brush through that. If you understand what's happening in that storyline of Egypt, Egypt was the most powerful empire at that time. Egypt was the most powerful government at that time. Pharaoh was God to the Egyptians. And yet, the people of God are under the oppressive rule of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It's impossible, according to human standards and human methods, to redeem God's people out of Egypt when you have this powerful man. Think about it like this. Put all the communist countries together in the world today, China, and we could go on and on and on, and put a million Americans inside of that country. And then the goal is to extract safely American lives from the communist rule of whoever the dictator is. Now, I know that falls short in that analogy, but that gives us an idea that this is mission impossible, so to speak, according to man's ways. But God redeemed his people by a mighty hand, by a mighty hand, he brings his people out of Egypt. And so from the time of the Exodus to the time of King Solomon's reign is roughly 900 years. Approximately 900 years. And why is this important? Well, you cannot have a kingdom without a king. And you cannot have a king without people who are delivered out of the oppressive rule of Pharaoh. If God doesn't save his people, there is no kingdom. Do we understand that? And if God delivers his people, then the promise that God made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 continues on. So God is the only one who could deliver his people. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, God commands, commands Moses to tell Pharaoh this. Thus says the Lord, and say to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So what is God doing? God is telling Pharaoh through Moses that Israel is my son. Israel is my son. I'm claiming my son. And I want my son back. So let my people go. And if Pharaoh refuses, then here's Pharaoh's punishment. I'm going to kill the firstborn of livestock, of every animal, everything, including your firstborn son, Pharaoh. I'm going to take your firstborn son. And in Exodus 12, 29, what happens? At midnight, the Lord strikes down all the firstborn of the land in Egypt. All those who were captive, whether they were in the dungeon or in the livestock, and if you remember, Pharaoh had a son at that time. Pharaoh's son is di dies. The Lord struck down Pharaoh's son because he did not obey the Lord. But if you remember what happened before that death, prior to the death of Pharaoh's son, there was a very special meal. Do you remember that meal? The Passover meal. And in Exodus 12, God tells Moses, tell the people, you're, you are to take a lamb, a male lamb, a lamb that's one year old, and you are to sacrifice this lamb at sunset. You can't just pick up a lamb at the corner market with spots and freckles and acne and all sorts of problems, right? You've got to find a very special lamb, a lamb that's one year old, a lamb that's one year old is also a male. And you're to sacrifice this lamb at sunset. So the idea here 
is substitution because the life of the animal is in the blood. So one person breaks the law of God and deserves judgment for this judged person, condemned person to go free, the life of an animal must be taken and that blood must be spilt in the place of the firstborn according to this context. So the blood of the lamb is to be placed on, you remember at the Passover meal, on the doorposts and on the lintels. And the Lord says, when I come through the land, when I see the blood on the doorpost, I will pass over and the plague and death will not touch you and your family. So that's the Passover lamb and the purpose of that Passover meal. When the Lord sees blood, there's no death to those who are inside that house. But if there is no blood on the doorpost, that firstborn child is going to die. That firstborn child is going to die. And so after the death of Pharaoh's son, Pharaoh says, enough. Moses, come here, up, go take all these Israel's, uh, Israelites out of here. I've had enough. Take these people from me. And so the Lord delivered his people through what? Through blood, through judgment. From the most powerful man and the most powerful government and the most powerful nation at that time. He delivered his people through the blood of the Lamb. There's deliverance through blood. There's salvation through judgment. That should remind us of another lamb, the lamb in the New Testament. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John sees Jesus. And John says this, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That does not mean every man, woman, and child is saved from the wrath, of, wrath to come. But when you look at the world and the world system and the world's appetite and craving for sin and rebellion against God, that they hate God, they're angry towards God, they're hostile towards God. Yet in God's kindness, He provides the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That doesn't mean that everyone's going to be saved. God provides atonement. That's the idea there. We break the law of God, we should die and be judged, and yet God provides the sacrifice of His Son, the Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus. Colossians 1.18 talks about the firstborn. It says this in verse 18, And He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. This verse is not saying, is not saying that Jesus was created. This is not saying that. This is not saying that Jesus was the physically firstborn child. That is not saying that. In the Old Testament, there's a concept of primogenitor. Primogenitor. What that simply means, and we know that in America, that when a family has a firstborn son and the father dies, the firstborn son is the legal heir to what? To the estate, right? He is the legal heir to that estate, to that family estate. So when you apply that concept, that Old Testament concept to Jesus, what that simply means is Jesus is supreme. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is worthy of dignity and honor and respect and praise. That's what that means. In other words, Jesus is greater than David. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Jesus is greater than all the Old Testament kings. And when we get to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says this, but with the precious blood of Christ. Did you hear that, dear saint? With the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Peter writes this, to encourage those who are discouraged, those who are persecuted, those who are dispersed. Peter writes to believers. He reminds them, you've been delivered. Remember, dear Christian, even though you're going through a difficult time, you're being persecuted for your faith in this 
Jesus, be encouraged. Be encouraged. You have been ransomed from the market of sin. You have been in bondage to sin. And God delivered you. God ransomed you by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ, by the spotless lamb. You've been ransomed from the feudal ways of the world, the world's ways, the world's traditions, the world's systems. You've been redeemed by empty paganism. That's what it means. And when you think about it, dear saint, we have been ransomed by the precious blood of that same lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what we go through, we need to be encouraged and reminded daily that God and His kindness has given us Jesus. It's because of His blood, not any other person, not any other blood, because no other blood can wash away our sins. No other blood can take away the guilt and the penalty of sin except the blood of Jesus. So King Solomon sees this glory cloud come down upon the temple and Solomon knows that God is holy. God is truthful. God is the deliverer of his people. So what's Solomon's reaction? We see this in verse 14 and 15. Please read with me. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel stood, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father. Solomon, what does he do? He blesses Israel. He says, Israel, we praise God. Why? Because God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his promise. God is faithful to his people. And then he turns around and he blesses God. Not that God needs Solomon's blessing, but it's a good thing that Solomon did that. It's good to bless God for what God has done for his people. Solomon blesses and praises God for his faithfulness. He praises God for his faithfulness. When you think about this, dear saint, God is faithful to us in more ways than we can ever imagine in more ways than we can possibly think or fathom. God has been absolutely faithful to you. God has been absolutely faithful to me. God has been absolutely faithful to us. He is the faithful God. God has carried you on eagle's wings every day of your Christian life. And when you were not even a Christian, God still provided for you. Praise God. God is faithful. You know, many times in this life, dear Christian, we are going to live with disappointments. We're going to live with struggles and trials and tribulations and real hurts and real pains, whether that's financial, emotional, mental, familial, whatever it may be. Many times it'll be spiritual. But God is faithful. God is faithful. Trust God at His word, dear Christian. God never promised us an easy life. Joel Osteen promises an easy life. Don't listen to that Jezebel. He's a prostitute. And everything and everyone that falls in that camp are prostitutes. Selling snake oil to people who are hurting. I don't have a problem saying that. It's true. And we need to quit living like, well, I can't offend people because I got to be PC. I got to be politically correct. No. They're Jezebels. God never promised us an easy life this side of heaven. But Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. Those who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Hey, if you're being persecuted for Christ, 
I pray that it's because you are a Bible-believing Christian, not because you're a jerk. Somebody should say amen to that. If the world persecutes us, let them persecute us because we love Jesus. Because we love Jesus. We're to trust in the Lord at all times. There's a Christian, as I close here, there's a Christian who wrote an interesting statement about being delivered. And he's writing this from the position of whether the Lord delivers me in this life or not. And this is what he says. I know my God is able to deliver, able to save from the direst human ill, able as when he saved the Hebrew children, almighty still. But if perchance his plans are not my plans, if hid in darkness should my pathway be, if when I plead he does not seem to answer nor care for me, then though men scoff and bitterly deride me, listen, I fling my challenge to the sky. God may deliver, but if not, I'll trust him. And I'll trust him even when I die. God never promised us an easy life. But God did promise that he would be with us to the very end. God promised that he is faithful. He truly is faithful, dear Christian. Be encouraged that our God is faithful. We should be like Solomon in our blessing to God. We should affirm, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. We can trust God. Why? Because he's holy. Why? Because he's truth, truth and truthful. Why? Because he delivers his people. A sermon in a sentence. It is good and right for the church of God to bless or praise him for his faithfulness. If we actually applied this, we would praise God every day of our lives for his faithfulness to us. Let us pray.